Hello, Internet. So nice to see you and welcome to this theory talk. So today we're going to talk about how to arrange songs for a single guitar, because playing guitar is fun and it's fun to play it in a band, to play with other people, but it's also fun to play by yourself sometimes. So, hey, and I just realized how many double entendres there are here. So mm, sorry about that. But hey, <laughs> OK, so we talk about how to arrange songs for a single guitar. OK, now uh, we are streaming live on YouTube and Facebook. I, I can see that there are a lot of you around. So if you're there, write something in the chat so I can say hi in a moment. And by the way, I just already see Eddie Metal. OK, <laughs> and smash that like button done. Yes, yeah, smash that like button immediately so you get it done immediately. OK, so first of all, I want to introduce you my guest today, guitar. Uh, acoustic guitar player extraordinaire. Okay, this guy has been a friend of mine for quite a long time at this point. And one thing I've always admired of him is how he arranges song for a single guitar. I mean, the guy's a one man band if he wants to. Okay, so I'm going to introduce you guys for the second time on Theory Talk Live to Simon Candy from Australia. Hello, Simon. Hello, Tommaso. How are you? Very good. Okay, let me. T uh, can you talk again? I want to make sure your, your microphone is loud enough for you. So. Sure. Fantastic. Uh, okay. Yeah. Excellent. How's it going, Simon? I'm very well. Very well. How about yourself? Very good. Very good. So, fantastic. Um, before we go on ahead, oh, and by the way, let me do this. Okay, fantastic. Okay, before we go on ahead, um, I'm going to tell you to everybody in uh, that is um, attending right now and to all our audience. Both Simon and I have free stuff for you. We're going to talk about this later. But the thing, the fun thing at Simon stuff, free stuff is exactly what we're doing today, meaning today is going to give you a taste of that. And then if you get his ebook, it's going to be much more there. And you'll find all the links for all our stuff in the description of this video on YouTube and on Facebook. So, uh, you know what, guys? Do this. Click on those links right now. Keep listening to us, but click on those links right now and get the free stuff immediately. Get the jump on everybody else. Get them before we finish them. Okay. It's it's PDF copies. We're not finishing them, but hey. Okay. <laughs> so fantastic. And since we are here, let's say hi to our audience. Okay. So we have, wow, we have uh, people from Brazil, Louis from Brazil, Eric from Canada. Uh huh. Oh, hi, Ron. Ron is one of my local students here. Okay. Uh, Dave Jones from LA, Derek from uh, Montreal, uh -huh, people from San Antonio, Brazil, um, <laughs> Dominican Republic. <laughs> even even somebody say, I am surprised I made this. Yay. <laughs> OK, good for you. OK, fantastic. So, Simon, let's talk about this thing about the songs then. OK, sure. so I have a first question for you because um, we, how do you choose songs to arrange for single guitar, okay? It's uh, I, I know what I do, but I want to hear what you do. Meaning, uh, do you do you do you simply pick the song you like best, or do you th do you think I have a specific technique in mind? I don't know chord melodies, and I'm picking and you're picking a song where this idea works. Or what, what's what's your thought process here? How do you choose songs to arrange for solo guitar? Okay, so generally speaking. It's uh, songs I like, um, songs that appeal to me in a lot of contexts. That's what I'll, I'll do. But sometimes I'll arrange things for the purpose of the exercise of exploring a technique or getting better at applying a particular technique. So it, in doing so, that might end up in an arrangement. But there's a lot of things I've arranged that have just solely have the purpose of um, you know, training that particular um, technique that I might be working on. So, for example, I'll give you an example. Um, there's a bluegrass tune called Redhead Boy. Um, so, it's got a melody that goes something like... Right? That's that's the basic sort of melody of the, the A section. So... I've looked at that melody before and I've thought, well, uh, how can I play that melody? Um, I've tried it with open strings. So this technique I use quite a bit, which is replacing any note in the melody that can be played with an open string with 
an open string, um, and you get a, a, a you know a different sound like that. So, for example, that melody. Okay, so good. I, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna stop you here for a moment because that sounds amazing. If you can take like the first five or six notes, spell them out, and and show exactly people what you're doing because I know what you're doing because but that's because I've seen you doing it for years. <laughs> okay, so but I guess some people here have, have no idea what you're doing. They see you moving your hand and they hear this wonderful sound coming out and they want to know exactly what you're doing. So, will you please? Sure, of course. Um... So basically, if I take the, let's just take that first little phrase there. So first thing is you want something in a key. Key is important when you're arranging things too. So you don't necessarily have to stay in the key of the original tune. Um, things can be a lot easier to arrange when it's in an appropriate key. So this example here and this approach lends itself well to keys with open string notes in them. So what I mean by that is the key has E, or at least most of the open strings, E, B, G, D, A, and E. So when I look at a, a little phrase like this one, I've got a D and a G. So instead of playing them as fretted notes, I'm going to play them as open strings. Okay, um, then the next phrase, now I'm looking here and I'm thinking, what's open strings? The B is, the C isn't, the D, the, we have a D open string, but not in that octave. We don't have a high D like this is an open string. We've only got the low, so we can't use it because we don't want to jump octaves in a, in a weird way. So I can use the B, this fretted note, and replace it with the open B, but still keep the fretted C and D notes. So this three note phrase becomes, and I, it's not an absolute hard and fast rule, but if you've got two fretted notes in a row, hammer on or pull off, depending if they're ascending or descending. So you get it, it adds to the smoothness of the sound. And then the last little part of this opening phrase, we have an E in the correct octave, so we can use our open E instead of the fretted note. And then uh, the D, the, the B returns, and then we're back to the C. So basically, we've really only got these two fretted notes. Um, all the others become open strings. We don't want everything as an open string because it wouldn't really work that well. It works out, it just works out really well um, if you're in the correct key, you know, key of C, key of G as I am in here, um, E perhaps, um, A, these are good keys, and if it's in a key that you want to stay in that key, and that's like B flat or E flat, well, that's where you bring a capo in, and you can still, you know, use the same technique. Yeah. So basically, the idea is that you are first trying to put all the notes you can on the open strings, and in case you just move the key so that the most not match the open strings of your guitar, or I think you could you could also use an, an alternate tuning, a different tuning, but. And then you're trying to not do the same thing twice in a row. So you're not picking two notes in a row. You are, you are, if two notes are, are, are fretted, you try to do a hammer on or a pull off or something else, essentially. So you just try to create a continuous variation in what you play. So it doesn't feel like a machine gun. <laughs> okay. It's not tan, 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 tan. Okay. Um, kind of a round robin idea. So, so people who do arrangements and stuff, you know, round robin is when. Um, you have a sample on a keyboard and every time you press the key it actually triggers a slightly different sound so that it doesn't sound like a machine gun. You're trying to do this on a guitar essentially. So, yep. So, your, your guiding principle here is to find melodies that are, that will work with this kind of approach essentially. Yeah, yes. So, it's definitely, um, if I take that same, it's, it's problem solving really a lot of this stuff. It's, you know, it's, it, and I like that challenge. It's like, well, how can I take this and make it work on the guitar? And uh, so I've worked with that same melody before. And for the purpose of building the technique, I thought, well, 
could I play a bluegrass tune melody using harp harmonics? That's a big part of my plan. I love that sound. So I could, I discovered. So basically I can take that same melody. Okay, so that's a little more complicated perhaps than the open string stuff. But again, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it, it, when you work on these particular techniques, you find techniques that you like and you apply them enough to all these different contexts, you, you see the patterns, you see the similarities. It's not so random once you've applied that same technique in the same sort of way, you know, to a melody, um, you know, 10 and 30 times. Times. Good. So um, I just want to highlight a couple of things you said, because the first one is, is that you said problem solving. <laughs> OK. And you like the challenge. So because mm, I know some people, especially beginners, uh, think that we grab the guitar, we think of a song and instantly we have this arrangement already done and we can play it perfectly smoothly. <laughs> and let me tell you guys, this is never the case. It's not for me, it's not for Simon, it's not for anybody else, no matter how professional they are. Um, sometimes we, when you get really familiar with a technique, you can improvise part of it. It always sounds best <laughs> if you sit down and figure it out and try different options, okay? Um, but that's the thing, it's problem solving, meaning that you have a technique you have a melody or a song and you need to find a way to make them work together. Okay. So like open strings or, um, harmonics, like Simon was showing right now. And there are different techniques too: chord melodies, uh, walking bass, uh, di di different ideas we, we can, we can show you later. Uh, but the point is it's problem solving. It's sitting down, trying different option, throwing away everything, but one and keeping the best one. Okay. So, just making it clear that, yeah, that none of these is natural in the sense that we grab the guitar and magically music spring out, which I want to highlight because nobody tells you that. Okay. When you, when you come here online, what do you see? You see, you open YouTube and you see those people that for one minute or a minute and a half play something wonderful as if they, as if it was completely spontaneous. It, it never is. Okay. Those guys sat down, wrote the arrangement, rehearsed it took a hundred takes okay, and published the best one. Okay. Just setting up expectation here on what's going to happen to you too. Okay. We, but, but the other thing is that it's fun, especially when you start knowing about a technique a little bit more, it's fun. It's not, uh, we like the challenge. Okay. It's sitting down with the instrument. We, we like, because it's fun to do it. It's fun to find a problem and solve it. And it's, uh, uh, fine, um, how can I say, getting the result out of it. It's, it really gives satisfaction when you, when you create a good arrangement, it's really satisfactory. Like I, I made this, <laughs> okay. It's, it's, it's fun. So that, that, that's just saying, um, by, by the way, guys, one thing, since we are here, uh, if you have questions about anything we're doing here, write the questions in the chat, and then we're going to find some time to answer them either while we go on or, or at the end. So any questions you have, any comment you want to make, write it in the chat. Whether you're on, on YouTube or Facebook, we receive everything. And I, I have here all the windows open. I can see all of them. So write them. We're going to answer them later. Really good. And the other thing that Simon said is that he knows some techniques. So for instance, Simon right now showed to you the open string technique and the artificial harmonic technique or um, harp harmonic, if you want to call them, whatever. No, it's not that Simon knows a thousand different techniques. Simon has, a f he knows more than those two. Of course, I don't want to say that. Sorry. Okay. But each one of us uh, learns a few techniques and then we specialize in even less than those. Okay. Two, three, five, ten. Okay. <laughs> if you're a virtuoso more, probably. Uh, and, but then we learn how to leverage those, those techniques and make several different arrangements with those techniques. It's not that you need to learn a hundred different techniques. Okay. You can try a hundred different techniques. Sure. But no musician knows everything and uses everything 
routinely, <laughs> okay? Again, just setting expectation because th that's what people write me sometimes. It's like, how can I learn um, chord melodies and these and that and that and that and that and that and, and apply all of them successfully on the same song? <laughs> like, okay, with years of practice, but start with one, <laughs> okay? Start with one thing. What do you think, Simon? Am I am, am I hitting the, the, the target here or, or am I saying something completely wrong? No, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It doesn't. I mean, if you gave me a melody now and said, just play that with open strings or half harmonics, <laughs> sorry, I can go and work it out um, and then play it for you. But uh, it's not going to be on the spot with that sort of stuff, typically. Um, I mean, I can improvise with those techniques, but when we're talking specific melodies and, and arranging a melody using that technique, uh, yeah, no. So it's, yeah, it's true. They, they, um, it takes time. And I can relate to, you know, students coming to you and saying, I want to do this, that, and the other. And, and it's just like, whoa, <laughs> that's a lot of stuff right there, which is possible, but you know, it takes, it takes time. Um, but it's, as you said, it's, it's a lot of fun. The challenge is great. And there's a lot of victories along the way. It's not like you got to kind of, okay, well, I'll start today and hopefully in a year I'll have some sort of satisfaction from this. There's a lot of small victories, almost session to session. And you get very quick at working out arrangements too. You do get, once you you know what you're going to do, you get much quicker at it. Um, the, the, the part that takes longer is getting the arrangement into your fingers. I can arrange some things reasonably quickly that can take sometimes months to get into my fingers. Um, so, you know, it's not always the arranged in itself that might take forever It's it or, or a while. It, it's getting then that arrangement into your fingers and making it sound musical as well, which is um, very important. Yes, that, that, that's, that's the other thing is that sometimes uh, intellectually we are, we are there very fast, <laughs> okay, because we know how to apply this technique, but actually playing it, that's a completely different situation uh, we were talking about this just before this live stream because we simon and i were just online uh, together for uh, 10 minutes before this live stream and we we're just discussing a little bit this thing and um i think i was making you this example it's uh, a couple of three weeks ago i think i i started writing an arrangement of uh, fly me to the moon using walking bass okay so the, the basic idea and by the way this is gonna tie with my next question but the basic idea is that i'm playing the melody and the bass line and no chords in between and the, the melody okay the usual the bass uh, takes the start with the root of the chord every time but then it works okay search so following the 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 the, the, um, the song so Okay, that's the idea. Now, I played and it looks easy now, okay? But it wasn't easy at the beginning. At the beginning, I, I had to write down the arrangement on paper because my finger could, simply could not play the damn thing. So once I had it on paper, I could sit down and say, okay. And that was everything I could play without going out of time. So I had to sit down and make sure my finger could do this and then add the next note and add the next note. and it. It was a very rough three days of practice there <laughs> before I could get anything remotely musical out of that. Okay, so see that's then again, I did this because I wanted to learn this specific technique too. So that's the thing. Sometimes to learn a technique, the best way is to grab a song, apply the technique, write an arrangement, and see how it works. But the expectation is never. I'm writing an arrangement today, and tonight I'm gonna go at the pub and play, and play it. <laughs> okay, <laughs> this is not gonna happen. Okay, you need to sit down and actually practice it. And again, just setting up expectation because I don't think people say that enough on YouTube. Okay, we in our culture of instant satisfaction, people think that we grab the guitar and boom, everything is done. But no, <laughs> it doesn't work this way. But that ties into my next question with, to you, Simon, which is when you arrange a song. How do you get a full sound out of your guitar? Because we got, we can play a melody, but what if you want to play the melody and the chorus or the melody and the bass line? How, how do you think and how do you arrange this on the guitar? Because on a piano, you have two hands, one for the melody, one for the bass or accompaniment. And again, I know this is not exactly this way, but 
you have two hands. On the guitar, you have the left hand and the right hand is to pick. You can't really separate those things that much. So what's your thought process? Okay, so if we're starting from zero, from the ground up, you've never put anything together on a guitar that has, you know, parts, uh, several parts of a tune. You got to think first, basically just three layers, bass, harmony, melody. So it doesn't matter how complicated something might be, we can break it down to those three layers. Bass, harmony, by harmony, I'm, I'm, I'm referring to chords and melody. I mean, think of a, a band, you've got the bass player, you've got uh, the guitarist strumming and you've got the singer singing the melody. So there's the three layers. Um, but we want to put that on to the guitar. So first thing is, kind of sounds obvious, um, learn the chords and the melody to the tune. Um, it's I see it all the time where people are trying to learn a chord melody arrangement and they're starting at the end. You know, it's like they've, they've got to tab off the internet and generally it's something that's way beyond where they're at with their playing. And, you know, they give up in frustration thinking they can't do it, but it's just simply because they've chosen something that's very difficult for where they're at if they're just starting. And uh, even if it's not that, they're starting kind of at the end by trying to put the bass, the harmony and the melody all together at once. So if I had a, a, a melody here, um, So I have that little melody there, this old Lang sign. Okay, so I've got the melody and I've placed it somewhere on the guitar, you know, um, purposely in the open position. That's a great place to start with chord melody. So I've got my melody. And I want to know what the chords are. I'm not going to put them with the melody yet. I just want to know what are these chords that are backing that melody. So we're going to C, we've got a G7, We've got a C and we've got an F chord. And I want to know, you know, there's no point playing C up here and G if your melody's down here. Obviously, you're not going to be able to put the two together too well if they're in different areas on the fretboard. So you want the melody and the chords in the same area, open position. Um, and then rather than just jump in and try and play the chords with the melody, just start with the root note of the chord. So you don't even need to form a full chord shape. You can simply play the root note of the C, the root note of G, root note of C, and the F. A little bit of a stretch there, but there's options around that. We're just getting the bass and the melody together, like the bookends, okay? No harmony yet. Um, just the bass and the melody. You could form the chord if you, you know if you want, but you don't need to. I mean, you will when we add the chords. But we're just playing the root note and the melody note, okay? And just getting an idea of not just knowing the chords and the melody, but what melody notes are happening with what chord. When is the chord changing in relation to the melody? And that's what you work out and get going in a very simple way here. And then once you've got that structure down, you can add chords. And that's easy to do for the most part, if you've already worked and got the foundation of melody and bass. So we can fill it out. I've done a little inversion there because it's not really appropriate, you know, practical to play an F chord and try and get that, that A there, which is out of the open position. So I use a little fragment there. I could put the F in there too if I wanted to. Um, but then you're starting to get a little bit more of an arrangement or well, a little bit more of a fuller sound here, a little bit more texture with um, the chord at it. But then, and these are, I'm just going through these steps reasonably quickly. You might spend some time on these steps, but this is the approach to take in my experience um, rather than just launching into something and just trying to learn it and not. The, the other, really, really understand. Yes. You understand that more long. And uh, it makes it easier to play and easier to make it sound more musical. I, I like it because the first thing is start simple, <laughs> okay? And, and then from there you can grow because you start simple, melody, melody plus bass line, a melody plus bass line plus the chord played only once per bar right now. And then from there you can build up. 
because later once you have those things those fingerings you can always arpeggiate the whole thing or add different things add a second voice whatever you want but the first thing it's always 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 do the simplest thing that you can do okay and get a minimum viable song essentially okay um which is something that we musicians have problems doing because rightly so we want we want to sound good we want to sound fancy we want to sound um creative so we never do the obvious thing but you start from the obvious thing and then you morph it into something great that's the thing but if you don't do the obvious thing first if you don't do the simple thing first it's hard to get on the on, on the good stuff essentially <laughs> right i mean that's what i think i don't want to put words in the mouth of <laughs> of someone okay but that's what i think um simon and uh, um once you've done but then let's go once you've done those simple things what's your thought process how do you how do you make it fancier how do you make it more complex okay so um once bass melody bringing chords then you can arpeggiate chords and, and get that technique down so if you if, this is a good example. If you just jumped into this arrangement here from you know, from zero, um, you, you're not going to understand the role of the notes because you've broken it down. Initially, you, you see what the bass is. I mean, you can probably see what the bass notes are, but where is the melody? That's very important because when you want to make something sound musical, you've got to have the melody not just playing with the chords, but you know, expressed in a dynamic way. Um, so it would be... that type of thing so basically it, different melodies will have uh, you know uh, some are sparse some are quite dense but there's always going to be pockets of space between the melody notes where there's an opportunity to arpeggiate the chord and just kind of fill it out a little bit and make it a little bit more interesting um, so that would be the logical next step to go on from okay learn the melody learn the bass uh, or learn the chord sorry and then find a position that you're going to play them on the guitar and then put the bass and the melody together. Now let's fill the middle part with some chords for texture. Now let's, um, you know, um, arpeggiate it out so it sounds nice and a little more full and interesting. And then you can look at it and go, well, can I make variations to the melody? You, you want to be sort of careful here because you don't want to lose the melody. It's not just make up your own melody or anything like that. But could it, could I make some variations to the melody and or could I um, add some extra chords in there, reharmonize parts, um, this type of thing? So maybe uh, uh, let's say. Okay, so there I'm taking some liberties with the melody, nothing too much. But the main thing there is I'm adding some chords to the harmony just to kind of make it a little bit more interesting. So when I came up to this F, it's just an opportunity for diminished there. Um, putting in the F chord, basically a really good way to reharmonize something is if I've got a melody and obviously then I have notes that are from the key, as long as the chord has that note in it, you can use it. So, you know, the first chord in this tune is C and the first note is C. But if I wanted to reharmonize it, make it sound quite different, I could uh, on the spot but uh you know you can reharmonize something to quite a degree there i didn't want to really totally change it um but i did want to um you know put some some different stuff in there another time here i could so when you got this 
da, da, da. you know, I could um, just play the C and the A minor, but I could put in uh, the E minor there. So instead of just I'm losing the melody. Instead of just playing the A minor on that E note, I'm playing E minor and then the A minor. And then the other time that same melody comes around, so that's the melody. That's so the first time C, E minor, A minor. The next time, I harmonized each note. And so I've got an extra chord in there. I've got my C, I've got my E minor, I've got my A, I've got my F. Now they all work because the G is in the C, the E is in the E minor, the E is also in the A minor, and then the C note, which are all the melody notes, is in the F chord. So, you know, you can do those things. And the other thing was changing the uh, melody, uh, the octave briefly. Which you can always do. You can displace the, the octave and move up, you know, momentarily and then back down if you like. But there's some things that you can do to sort of fill something out and, and decorate it. Yeah, and and, and this is that, that's one moment where I, I have to point out that that's because Simon knows his theory. <laughs> okay. In I mean, he knows how to make a chord substitution, he knows how to harmonize a melody, and it's not hard stuff. Okay, it doesn't, doesn't require years and years and years of study. It's just knowing what, 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 he, what he can do. And he knows how to apply this on the fretboard. Simple as that, <laughs> okay? Because I have, you know, there's the usual debate like, but does theory make me less creative because theory rules, uh, whatever, I don't want to sound in the box, etc. But no, theory makes you more creative because it gives you all those options, okay? And uh, all, all, the, all, all those melodies. And there's the, the very ending of a melody, for instance, which in, in, in this kind of song, it's always a cadence, okay? Uh, okay, the very ending of every melody. And there are all the ways to reharmonize it. Okay. Which, which is, this is a um, dominant um, prolongation, meaning I, I keep the G at the base on all the chords, I could do substitution, I could put other, other stuff in there. But knowing the options you have allows you to harmonize it in a way you like, or creating variation on the harmonization like Simon was doing. And so every time you play through the same melody and the same chord, you can change the chord, so it, it, it feels different, essentially. And it feels like the song is progressing somewhere. Okay, and again, they're not talking here about uh, take four years at the university studying the hardest thing you can study. This is simple harmony, okay? We are talking triads, seventh chords at most, not uh, super modern cluster serial <laughs> writing and other stuff. Applied to the guitar, okay? And uh, it's j and again, every if you don't once you know those things, if you don't want to sound this way, you can always do exactly the opposite, okay? It still saves you time because it, 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 it starting theory in this way um, just tells you that's how you get the sound, that's how you get that other sound, that's how you get this other sound. Do you want them? Great. You don't want them? Do something different. Okay. So don't waste time. You don't waste time doing what every, everybody else was doing before you. Okay. Anyway, just saying. I, I just need to put this in because people keep keep uh, asking me if theory makes you less creative, and Simon just showed you it's the exact opposite. It's the exact opposite. And of course, Simon is familiar with his theory, so he doesn't have to sit down and think and calculate everything. He knows where the chords are. His hands know where the chords are. So it's not that, because he learned it already. So it's not that you have to sit down and, and, and spend a lot of time in there. Simon, there's something I want to talk about, which is um, texture in, the, in, in arrangement. So for people who don't know, Simon said, said that there were, Simon says, Ha, huh, I just realized that. Sorry. Uh, so, sorry about that. Um, but Simon said <laughs> that there are three different elements in a song, which is perfectly correct. Melody, harmony, and the bass line. Okay. And of course, they're all related. Okay. And texture is what you play. So you play only the melody, the melody and the bass line, the melody and the chord, but not the bass line. All three. Or you can just play the bass line and the chord and forget the melody for a moment. This is the texture of the song. Okay. So... 
And one thing you can do, but there are essentially two things you can do. One thing is keep the texture constant throughout the song. So for the whole song, you play, I don't know, the melody and the bass line, but not the chords, say. Or you can change texture. So for the verse, you play the melody and the, and, and the bass line, but for the chorus, you bring in the chords to make it fatter and bigger and, and, and give a difference, okay? So, and I've heard arrangements by Simon for a long time. And by the way, if you never heard this arrangement, go on his website, ask him, write him an email, okay? Because <laughs> he has a lot of videos on this stuff. Um, one thing I like a lot in Simon's arrangement, or in your arrangement, Simon, is that you change texture and you change texture pretty often too. So you play a part with the chords, then you play only the melody, then you play, a, they put back, the chords come back in, then you have a little bass line and all this kind of thing. Um, do you want to comment on these, on how, how you think about that? What, what, what's your thinking about all these? Okay, so, yeah, I think if you just put the melody with the chords, that's a starting point. But if that's all, you, if you just do the same thing for the whole arrangement, let's say typically an arrangement could be anywhere from three, maybe five minutes, three to five minutes. So it's going to, you know, you're going to get that and then you're going to think, okay, well, that's great. But once I do that once, maybe twice, it's kind of like, it sounds a bit repetitive. So you've got to have ways to build something. So that process I went before wasn't so much like, okay, now you can do the bass and the, the, um, the, the melody. You don't need to do that anymore. That's step one. You, you're done. That's an approach that in itself to me is a full, is a, is a, is an arrangement, a short one but an arrangement of melody and, and chord, chord melody. In this case, just very sparse though. You need light and shade. So, um, so yeah, I do like to um, mix things up. Sometimes I do it just for the purpose of, again, training and being able to put between different techniques. Um, let me perhaps give you an example here. Um, okay, so we all know this this tune <laughs> it's by the way if, if you guys see simon click in there because simon is great but he doesn't have infinite memory so he doesn't has all his arrangements by heart but he wrote them down <laughs> so now he's actually gonna find one and sight reading it <laughs> okay so just keep this in mind when you listen to him because i mean it's good that he can sight read this kind of stuff go on, go on ahead <laughs> you exposed me tomorrow so this is all in my head <laughs> Now that is very true. It's sometimes people have this false sort of thing of it's, I've got to remember everything I've ever played. And if I, oh man, I could play that once. Now I cited it. Don't worry. If you don't play things regularly and regularly is like almost every day or, or, you know, certainly playing through arrangements on a weekly basis, they go, um, I've got arrangements I've done that if you ask me to play them now, yeah, right. Um, <laughs> quite complicated ones though, but I could relearn them and they do come back into your fingers pretty quickly. That might not feel like it before you go and do it, but when you start to play, it's like, ah, oh, yeah, that's right. Um, so yeah, that's certainly true. I'm sorry reading at the moment on some of these things. So, um, Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, we all know that tune, of course, but there's lots of ways that you could, uh, play that tune. And so I'll play through a, an arrangement here. What it's going to do is it's going to begin reharmonized pretty kind of out there reharmonization which i could go into if you're interested I, I like the outside stuff sometimes i do these things just for a bit of a laugh or you know just out of curiosity actually curiosity is is a really good word when you're arranging stuff you're just thinking what if i did this to that what would it sound like so um so i did that with with this tune then i go into sort of bring it into more of a tempo and I play like a Travis picking, which I like doing. Um, and then a bit more of a walking bass. And so there's three techniques or three approaches here, the reharmonized um, rubato uh, approach into time with Travis picking um, into like a walking bass. So let's see if I can uh, demonstrate that for you.
Let's pick you. So that's a pretty quick arrangement. If I was, that's not really a serious arrangement that I would play necessarily, but I would spend more time in each of those areas and flesh it out a bit more and, and create something a bit longer. But in a nutshell, that's what I'm wanting to do with an arrangement. Maybe not necessarily that many things need to happen, but. Um, it's just a way to um, really, if, I, if I'm, you know, I want to expand the way I can arrange things. So I'm always going to try stuff. And sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. So fine, it doesn't work. There's been plenty of things that don't work. Um, but there's also been plenty of things that initially don't seem to work, but you kind of try them in various contexts and situations and they, they work quite well. well that's that's kind of switching between different approaches across the, the one tune for development and, and variety and um how did you how did you write all this down i mean it's it's a score standard notation you have you have the chords symbols on top it's tablature what what it is yes i just tab it i tab it out i could sit there and i could notate it out but it would take time and there's not really any any point to doing that for for my purposes so i i write things out all all the time um sometimes by hand Sometimes I will then, you know, put it in a, an editing software. Uh, but I've got tons of things. I've got filing cabinets full of stuff, not just arrangements, but just things over the last, uh, I probably started doing this consistently about 20 odd years ago. And I go back to things and I look at the date and it's like 2007 or 2003. And I'm, oh yeah, that's right. I'll, I'll revisit this. And some arrangements have happened over years really, because I revisit them after you know, having given them a little bit of a rest. So, yeah, so that and I will, you know, just record myself on the phone or, you know, uh, I'll do that. Do that. But, but I want to specify, yeah, it's a tablature. It's not a standard, standard notation because see, that, that's an, the other myth that we are fighting against constantly is that you need to do use, use standard notation, otherwise you're not a real musician or this kind of thing. Like, guys, if you know how to read standard notation, good for you. I can. I think I don't know if you, if you can, Simon. If you know some standard notation, I mean, maybe not sight read a complex score, but I can. Um, but when you notate down this stuff, it's better to do it in tablature because it also specifies the position of the chord. You don't have to recalculate everything and find the dividend where it is. So in this case, especially if you know the timing or if you have a recording of yourself, tablature is way, way, way more practical than standard notation. Okay. Sure, you cannot communicate this to another musician, but let's not forget, we are writing for solo guitar right now. You cannot, you don't have to communicate with a piano player or a bass player about all this. And if you have to, you just give them the chords and let them figure it out. Okay, so it's not true that tablature is bad for you. It depends how you use it. And that's a good use. I mean, I, I, nobody can look at Simon and think, yeah, this arrangement would be better if you <laughs> put it in standard notation. No, okay, that's so. Just saying, okay, that's uh, sorry. It's a point I want to make here, okay. But yes, and I agree with you. You you write those things down, you keep them, um, and then down the years you revisit them, you polish them a little bit, okay. It's important to write down those things because that's the other thing that most people don't realize, and I want to warn our audience on that is that. You guys are going to write an arrangement, keep it all inside here, and the week after, it's gone, <laughs> okay? Or the day after, sometimes. Keep a piece of paper in front of you and jot down those notes, okay? Don't rely on your hands or your brain to remember this stuff, because when you write one arrangement, you think you can do it. Once you write two, three, four arrangements, you forgot the first. That's, that's, your memory does not have that kind of power, not right now, at least. If you play this stuff every day, like, you, like Simon was saying, then you keep it in repertoire, essentially, then yes. But even then, the moment you drop an arrangement and you don't play it anymore, 
you're going to forget it. You are. And I know plenty of uh, uh, professional musicians, successful musicians who have albums out that you know, okay? And um, they, uh, when, when they go in tour, they just really learn the album, okay? They listen to their, to, to their recording, figure out what they were doing, or they have their notes, and relearn the song from scratch. Because they don't play it every day. They play it in tour. In tour, they don't have to do it. Once the tour ends and they take a few months off, they can forget this stuff. And it's hard to play um, a, long, <laughs> a very long set list, okay, every day. I mean, take, I don't know, somebody like Steve Vai or Satriani or just Satriani. Those guys are not playing their whole discography every day, okay? <laughs> when they go into tour, they have to really learn it. That's what it is. Okay, just saying, again, setting up expectations. So write it down. Okay. Um, uh, I have a, we have a few questions from the from the chat, and the first one I want to comment is this one. It's like it's is voice leading something to consider studying in deep. I'm, I'm letting you answer the first, first, and then I can comment on this, Simon. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, something to consider studying in deep. Yeah, for sure, because then you. I mean, for me, you'll always have a chord available. You know, if we're looking in the context of chord melody playing, as we're talking about here today, you'll always have a chord available to you wherever the melody note is. So, so yeah, in looking at voice leading, you expand your knowledge, um, your vocabulary, um, but you get nice, smooth chord changes, essentially. So, you know... Um, I have a chord progression. I mean, if uh, what was the, it was the C, the G, the C, and the F from that earlier tune. So, you know, if I can find those chords, C, and then my, uh, no, it was G, wasn't it? So C, then the G, then the C, and the F. I think that was it. So, you know, I've got little triads here, and they're moving, each note of the chord is moving in the smallest increment possible to get to the next chord. Maybe just that one actually, so we we can just keep them all as that do. Or I could play it down here where I've got my uh, C, G, and then my F will be here somewhere. I'm looking for my F and I'm just going blank. So there, we, yeah, that'd be that one. Looking for the closest chord. So the notes of one chord, either sometimes you'll have a common note and other notes will move generally by a fret or. Um, Two frets, and it gets a very nice, smooth sound to your ear. So absolutely, and and if you move them all over the fretboard, you expand your chord knowledge, your chord vocab, and you will always have a chord available um, to play. When I was doing that arrangement before, I had this uh, A note, I'm thinking well, I can't really play the F to get that A, but here's a little triad shape that allows me to play an F in the position of that A note. There's no, you know, unless I put it down an octave, which I don't want to do, there's no other option. Well, there are, yeah. I could play also the root note down here if I want a bit more of a full sound. But uh, I'm not going to really be too practical getting that note with the F bar chord there. So, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely studying um, voice leading will be very beneficial. And I would agree. And the thing is, the more you study voice leading, if you do it straight on the guitar, the more you also get more chord knowledge because you start seeing how those chords connect to each other. It's they're easier to remember because you connect them. It's not, you know, it's not I have to learn 2,000 different chord shapes. <laughs> you learn a few chord shapes and then you start connecting them and then so it, everything becomes easier. It, it's more musical. Uh, it, it makes more sense when you play this stuff on the guitar. Um, I have a course, Complete Core Mastery, sorry, <laughs> shameless plug here, but that's exactly what we do. From the very first session, we start doing voice leading, but not the voice leading you see in music books, which is a bunch of rules. It's the practical voice leading of doing this stuff on the fretboard. I mean, at the end, they're the same thing, okay? But uh, reading a book, you don't get this, okay? We, it, it needs to be done on the fretboard. And this applies to all level. And thinking about voice leading is what makes you sound smooth and connect those things. Otherwise, those chords are just uh, random sounds that, that doesn't, don't, don't connect. I have an arrangement that I made years ago now, which I was, I was just looking at it just before this. Uh, yeah. 
courts are not easy. Okay, but um, all those are the chords of the original song, maybe a couple of diminished thrown in when I, when I, for fancy, um, but voice led following the melody. Okay, you look at this stuff and you're thinking, whoa, you know, guys, guys not a thousand chords. No, I don't. I just follow what's written on the score. Okay, and um, and by the way, that, that, that was, when, I, when I wrote this because I wanted to harmonize every, literally every single note, so you have passages like... Uh, <laughs> which is super hard to play, okay? In reality, on a real arrangement, you would probably not do that, you will do... Okay, so you will lighten up the textures, which what we, what we were saying before, okay, meaning you will just play one chord and then just one note for the melody. So the textures become lighter, it's easier to follow, it's easier to play. But again, it depends what the what kind of, of effect you want to do, okay? Like Simon was saying before, we experiment with that. We create more than one arrangement. We try, okay, what the, what if? And what if is a magic question? No. What if I play a chord for every note? What if I don't? And what if I play a chord for every two notes? What if I play only a note in the bass for every note? And what if I don't? Uh, can I make it busier, lighter, sparser, denser? Okay, all this kind of thing. Can I inject more rhythm, less rhythm, faster, slower, okay? Rubat, all this kind of thing. So we experiment. But when we do all these, we always have an eye to voice leading. In a sense, I will say that if you know your voice leading well, you know 90% of useful theory. <laughs> okay, You can always learn more, but um, voice leading seems to touch all the other topics of music theory. And so if you start studying your music, your, your voice leading, you're never wrong. <laughs> okay, That's the thing. Um, I have another question here, which is these. I've started looking into ninth chords, and uh, I, don't, I don't know if Francis means add nine or actual ninth chords, but we can talk about both. Is there a general approach on how to voice such notes? Uh, Simon, do you use ninth chords in your playing? Yeah. Um, so I will use, yeah, um, I'm sure I, I use ninths. Quite a bit. Ninth's always, well, if we're talking about dominant ninth chord, it's always got a, a, a smooth sound compared to the dominant seventh chord. <clears throat> Smoother sort of sound. So, you know, you've got, this is a very stock standard dominant ninth chord, which you can hear in you know, funk sort of stuff, jazz, rhythm and blues, soul, etc. Everything really. But, you know, so that's a, you know, simple chord to find because the root note is on the fifth string so it's a, essentially root five chord so if you can find your root five bar chords you just got to learn this shape to be able to yeah move it around to different dominant ninth chords um you know if you if you like to what i was saying before if you understand your you know through looking at chord voices and studying chords you understand how they're built and how they're constructed you can work off of a, a seventh chord and just add a note to make it a ninth. So if I've got a little A7 chord here, I can just add the B note on the top string, there's a ninth. I'm talking dominant ninth chords here. Um, so there's, you know, there's uh, various ways, I think, uh, uh, is that nine? Yeah, because that's got a B in there as well. So there's another ninth voice in there, um, root six. So there's lots of, um, and they're all pretty smooth sounds. I like the, the sound of the ninth chords. Um, add nine chords, definitely. Um, again, if you understand the structure of chords, then you can create these yourself from based off, you know, the, the foundation of the chord, the minor or the dominant chord. Um, and that's always good to do. But um, yeah, so definitely, yeah, definitely worth, um, looking at because it's giving you different shades of the same sort of sound, dominant, major, minor, etc. So minor, nine, so minor nine. Nine. Yeah, exactly. And you learn, learn a few shapes and you, you start playing with those. Uh, whether it's dominant seven or seven with nine or add nine, my suggestion would be put those nine as high as you can. <laughs> okay. So, uh, well, there's a different thing, but you don't want to put the nine on the same octave as the root note, on the, on the lowest root note. Because then you get a strong conflict between the lowest root note and the ninth. 
Um, if you play these, or the minor version, that's the ninth, and it's still one octave higher than the root, which is on the sixth string open. Okay, but you can also play these, or the minor version. You guys can see this with okay when the ninth is two octaves higher than the root note and those are both good versions because the root the, the ninth is not confl conflicting with the lowest root which is again it's the e on the open string it's practically impossible to play on a guitar the e and the f sharp at that low um low here but for other on the e at least but on uh, on other chords it could be possible and when you when you do it tend to it tends to sound bad actually because they are just too low okay so just voice that nine high at least not on the lowest octave of the of the chord that would be the thing um i mean unless you are exactly into chords that sound extremely conflicting dissonant and all this kind of, and then then it's a good it's a good idea but in general you don't want to do that Okay, again, it's hard to say what you can and cannot do in music theory, because if you want the exact opposite effect, that's exactly what you need to do. Well, let's say that 90% of the time, 75, 99, whatever, um, you do not want a conflict between the root and the ninth on the low octave. If you're trying to create music that sounds extremely unsettling, like horror movie, okay, <laughs> then do. No problem. But then, but then there are even... You, you want to go even further there. You want to you want to put even more dissonance and bad notes to make it sound that way. But that would be the idea. Very good. Okay, I have a question here, and I don't know if it's for you, Simon, or for me, but maybe you can help me here. You did a lesson with Thomas about a year ago using fourths. Can you read some of this to this live event? Uh, I have no mind of me doing anything with fourths. Were you doing something with fourths? Uh, you, you were. Okay, would you like to comment on that? Sure. So that was the chordal harmony, I think. I know Robin. How are you, Robin? Um, and yeah, chordal harmony. So basically, Tersian harmony, which is traditional harmony, is stacked thirds. So if you look at any chord, the relationship between any of the consecutive notes within a chord is going to be a third. So in a C major chord, for example, and major chord in general, C to E is a major third, E to G is a minor third, G to, um, well, okay, that's, that's going to be a fourth there, but uh, G to, if we extended the chord to C major seven, G to the B is a third. So you look at all chords and their combinations of major and minor thirds. Um, quadal harmony is where we change that and we have the distance of a fourth between the notes of the chord. So if I have um, like a D here and I want to harmonize that D, create a chord, build a chord off of it using chordal harmony, then I want to stack fourths on top of that note to create the chord. So that's my D. Works out nice on the guitar because our strings bar the second and third strings are tuned in fourths so this is why chordal harmony is quite a cool thing to play with on guitar particularly um, then we've got our d g is in the very next fret on the string above d to g is a fourth from the g we want another fourth g to c so all good that's a fourth from the c we want a fourth c to f that is a fourth and then from the f we want a fourth f to be flat so I've gone from the D and I have created a little quarter harmony chord shape. Um, and that, in a nutshell, that's, that's what quarter harmony is. And when you work that out, I mean, you don't have to build it yourself from scratch. It's good to have that understanding. But then you uh, learn the shapes and you realize that there's actually, uh, let's see. There's not that many shapes because of the, the nature of the chord being stacked in fourths. Um, it's, just, it's, it's a very ambiguous sound. There's a lot that you can do with it. It's way more than I could just cover in a, in a couple of minutes here. Um, however, um, you can use it in lots of different ways. It's a great way to sort of uh, comp, meaning uh, someone's soloing. It's used a lot in jazz. Um, 
very common in, in jazz. And uh, if you listen to sort of Bill Evans in the 50s with Miles Davis, there's a very, um, uh, very famous recording where he was basically using quarter harmony all the way through, but on piano. Um, and uh, kind of blue, isn't it? That's the name of the album. Yes, yes, it's it's it's. Uh... So what now? It's it's nearly a quarter chord, nearly because it's exactly a bar chord, <laughs> a bar on a bar chord. Okay. Uh, the way I remember the sound of quarter chords is thinking of uh, Star Trek, the original series. And when you when you. Do... Okay, and it's 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 that, it's that sound. It's the science fiction '60s, '70s. Okay, sound. Quarter chords were really popular in in um, soundtracks in that period of time. So, any kind of science fiction or even mystery movie had, had this kind of sound thrown in somewhere. So, that's how I remember it. But uh, and, and by the way, the the person who asked Robin also said. Perfect. So I think we nailed the answer here. Okay. You nailed the answer, Simon. Very good. Okay. Simon, I know you have something for our, for our audience. Okay. I, I know you have an um, ebook that you want to, to, to give to our, our audience. So I'm going to put that in. Okay. Yes. So I have an ebook here that basically takes you through the steps I outlined earlier. Um, taking a tune, and before we even get into the tune and learn the chords and the melody, I take the tune and work it through some different keys to show you possibilities, but also how you can kind of be doomed from the start, if you like, if you just start in the incorrect key. The incorrect key meaning the melody ends up on strings where you can't really harmonize with it or it becomes difficult. Generally speaking, you want the melody to be on the top three strings. Then you can have the lower three strings to create the bass and the chords and so forth. It's a general thing and we can put the melody anywhere, theoretically and, and so forth. But when starting particularly, and a lot of the time anyway, the melody is going to be on the top three strings. So we look at the different keys that you can play something in and what might be the best key for our tune in this book. And then I go through the chords, the melody, putting the bass with the melody, filling in the, the, the center, if you like, uh, the middle with um, the harmony chords, and then breaking that up with arpeggios, and then um, adding some things, you know, different chord voicings and things that we can do to kind of decorate it and, and develop it. So the tune in the book I use for that is uh, Danny Boy. So it's a different tune to the one earlier, but it goes into great detail. There's recordings of everything so you can hear how it should sound. And the idea is, as I said earlier, is just to be able to, um, you know, approach this style of playing from an angle that's going to show you that you can do this. Often, you get on YouTube and you watch people playing chord melody pieces and they're playing some really cool stuff that's very, very high level. And then people have this perception that chord melody is really difficult to play. It's not difficult to play. Um, sure, like anything, you can have different levels, but, you know, it's, it's, it doesn't have to be complicated and it will still sound good too. And then from there, you can build it like any skill. So that's the approach with this book, starting from the beginning, not the end, and working through it in a systematic way. So you end up with an approach that you can take to any other tune that you want to play. This will work with anything. Um, you just want to make sure you pick the right key to work with first. So you can get that from, uh, yeah, from the website there. You have everything in the description, guys. You can go there. I totally recommend the ebook. Very detailed. You want you guys want to go and and look at that. I have something for you too, guys. So uh, mine is completely different, and that's a completely it's a brand new ebook. I, I literally just published this. Okay, so those are 18 tips to make your pentatonic solo sound professional. You, 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 we all know and use the pentatonic scale. Okay, you guys know the pentatonic scale. Yeah. Okay, but between these and sounding like, I don't know, David Gilmour by Pink Floyd, uh, Jimmy Page, Jimi Hendrix, okay, all, all those great players, there's a pretty big gap. No, I mean, those guys are playing the pentatonic scale, but they're not just playing the pentatonic scale. They're not playing other scales. They're just playing the pentatonic scale really well. So 
how do we go from just the scale to sounding good, okay? How do we go from uh, to, I don't know, and I got this wrong now. Yeah, that's the right thing, okay. How do we go from the, from the scale to actually playing something interesting on that, okay? So, and the thing is, um, if you ask a good player, they will just tell you it comes with experience, experiment with that. And what I think instead, I mean, if you, some of those people have some natural talent, there is some natural talent, or they just spend a lot of time figuring it out, but they're not able to explain it. Uh, I have no natural talent to speak of. So what I did in the past 25 years, more or less, okay, is uh, obsessively watch those people and try to see what they are doing rather than what they are saying. And so I collect the number of tricks that can that you can apply and I explain them in, in details, in all the details. So, and I collect an 18 of the best tips in this ebook here. And it's a free, completely free ebook. You go, you download it. The only thing I'm asking if you download it, okay, that I would say no string attached, which is always fun to say <laughs> when we talk about guitars, but uh, there is one string attached. If you like what's in this ebook, if, if, it, if it makes a difference for you, and by the way, it should make a difference pretty much immediately, you read it, get a couple of those tricks and you can play them immediately and you can hear a difference immediately. If this is true, if I'm right, just send me an email and tell me that it's true, <laughs> okay? I just want to get feedback on that. Get this ebook at this link and then if it makes a difference for you, if it makes a difference for you, if you're sounding better, just send me an email to let me know. I would really, really, really appreciate that. Very good, okay. And now, Okay, Simon. So I think we need to close this. I, I, I will say yeah, the three hours ch chatting with you on this stuff because, <laughs> because I'm learning okay, just by watching you. But we cannot we cannot do a streaming for three hours. Okay, so Simon, any any closing word you want to say to our audience? Um, I would just say just to to wrap up the things we're talking about very briefly. Start from the start. Don't try and just jump in at a you know level eight when you should really be on level one. Don't be discouraged if you learn something and forget it. Welcome to the club. That's what happens. Um, you'll hear all the great players say the same stuff. And if they're rolling out tune after tune, like Tommy Emmanuel, well, he plays 300 plus days a year. So, you know, if you do that and you play those songs, I mean, he's brilliant, but he will forget tunes too if he doesn't play them regularly. So... Um, don't be discouraged by that. Um, they come back into your fingers pretty quickly when you put a little bit of time into them. It's not like starting from the start again, even though that's how it might feel initially. So, yeah. But uh, other than that, uh, I think that's about it, Tomas. Very good. So, thank you, Simon, for coming. I know uh, I'm, uh, we always have this thing that since we live in Australia, down under, and live in Canada, we always have the, a way to <laughs> you need to find a way to connect our schedules so that it's not night. <laughs> for one of us, but we seem to have managed this time at least. Um, thank you for coming. Uh, for me, it was really enlightening. I hope it was the same for our audience. Thank you everybody who, who was here. Thank you everybody who asked a question. We are gonna see you guys soon with new videos and other live streams. And until next time, enjoy.